I think this is a really fascinating uh, example of, of the kind of sources we have on Berkeley Bullock. Uh, this is the story of how he learned to read and write, and it tells us a lot about the social world of the slave community and how the, the strategies, strategies of resistance that they employed across households and generations. This is Berkeley Bullock's son, Charles. It's from his memoir. This is from 1949. He was interviewed by Pearl Graham. Peter Fawcett taught my father, Berkeley Bullock, to read and write by light wood knots in the late hours of night when everyone was supposed to be asleep. They would steal away to a deserted cabin <coughs> in the big house out of sight. Um, and this is this is this story of Peter Fawcett being uh, the person who, tr who taught uh, Berkeley Bullock is documented in several places. This is another <coughs> source from 1900. While with the family of John R. Jones, he, Peter Fawcett, taught all the slaves to read and write, one of whom was Mr. Berkeley Bullock of this city, who for several years was the proprietor of the only restaurant at Union Station in the city. Oh, wow. It's remarkable to have this many sources. But we also have, Peter Fawcett talks about this as well. Um, and the backstory on Peter Fawcett is he had once been enslaved to Thomas Jefferson. He was born at Mon Monticello in 1815, taught by Jefferson's grandson, Louis Randolph, to read, and then was sold at auction to Colonel Jones after Jefferson's death. So he talks about this. What, what he, there's much more to his memoir about that transition from Monticello to Colonel Jones's house. But the part I'm going to highlight is his description of literacy and the, the threat that posed to Colonel Jones. Um, when I was sold to Colonel Jones, this is Peter Fawcett, I took my books along with me. One day I was kneeling before the fireplace spelling the word Baker when Colonel Jones opened the door and I shall never forget the scene as long as I live. What have you got there, sir, were his words. I told him. If I ever catch you with a book in your hands, 39 lashes on your bare back. He took the book and threw it into the fire, then called up his sons and told them that if they ever taught me, they would receive the same punishment. But over time, uh, the Joneses came to trust uh, Peter Fawcett, and he adds, notwithstanding that all the time I was teaching all the people around me to read and write, and even venturing to write free passes mm -hmm. and sending slaves away from their masters. <laughs> of course, they didn't know this, or they would not have got me so valuable. <laughs> So what a connection, right? So Berkeley Bullock was taught to read by Peter Fawcett, uh, who lives a very long life and is, is honored in his old age when he returns to Charlottesville and, and reconnects with Ber Berkeley Bullock's son and others. So what did Berkeley Bullock do with his literacy? Uh, he attempted to run off. He, he attempted <laughs> to steal away. He, he did at least once run away, uh, perhaps with the aid of a forged pass, getting as far as the Ohio River. And how do we know this? We know this from a WPA narrative mm -hmm. given by Horace Tonsler of Charlottesville. He shared the story with the, a WPA interviewer. And it's the story that Berkeley Bullock told to him. This is Horace Tonsler. Yes, I know the case of a runaway slave, Berkeley Bullock. And he has two sons living here now. One day we was driving up the road, and he showed me the very road he used when he first escaped. The road led to Bath County. He said he traveled at night by the moonshine. Said he would feel around the trees and whichever side the moss grew on, he knew that was the north direction. Then he said he boarded a stage that went as far as the Ohio River. He aimed to get across. Um, and there's a kind of amusing anecdote about he, how he blacks up a white man who's sleeping, a drunk white man, and so the conductor puts him off the train. Mm -hmm. and it didn't conclude all that, but it's, it's all part of Boris <coughs> Tonsler's story. But apparently Bullock did get captured, so he eluded capture, but, but he was still on the stage when it got the Ohio River, and they caught him there before he could make it across the river. But he may have been using the, 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 the ability to read and write. He may, have, he may have forged his own pass, just as Peter Fawcett had intended. So what happens then? He's returned uh, and presumably put back to work, and then I think this is always a crisis in the lives of the enslaved, right? When you are sold. That's what happened with Peter Fawcett. It happened to Berkeley Bullock as well. When Colonel Jones became embarrassed by financial troubles in the 1850s, he sold 36 valuable slaves to cover his debts. And bankruptcy records dated 1855 indicate that Bullock, Berk, there, his, his 
Berkeley, listed as Berkeley, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. Berkeley, S. Maupin, 1205. So we believe that he was sold to Socrates Maupin, a professor of chemistry at the University of Virginia. His mother, Cynthia, sold to William Brand for $5. She would have been elderly, sold to another. And apparently his brother, <coughs> is it on this page? I didn't include Isabella. that. Isabella. I believe that there, another source, Sam Towler, I, I believe. Is Sam here today? No. I think Sam has suggested that his brother was also sold to another uh, buyer. So this is Socrates Maupin. He lived in Pavilion 8 on the lawn. Oh. That's a, a picture taken by University Communications today, and I found this on the uh, Special Collections website. This is kind of a mystery. Uh, so Socrates Maupin pa Maupin's papers are at the University of Virginia, and when you read the finding aid, it says topics include plantation management, crops, the tobacco market, slave purchasing, hiring, and discipline, and, other, and, and land values, things that might have some bearing on our story, right? Especially slave purchasing, hiring, and discipline. And so my son and I, this is Gideon, my son, first year at UVA. <laughs> he, uh, when I came up here this week and I said, I want to meet you at Special Collections. <laughs> and we pulled up the, uh, the Maupin papers. Oh. And what's curious about it is, that there's, this is the finding <coughs> aid that we read there. There's no mention of slavery in this finding aid. So we didn't have, we couldn't go to letter X or Y or Z and find any reference to slavery or hiring or discipline. It may be in there, but I don't know why that the online index doesn't align with the printed index. There's another collection of papers with it that belongs to a man named Washington who writes to Maupin, but there's nothing in that index or finding aid that mentions slavery either. So this needs more work. Let me just say that, you know, it's, I think I will say one other thing, that the letters that are in this collection end in 1851 before the Berkeley Bullock was purchased at bankruptcy sale. So they may not mention him by name, but I think it would be useful to get whatever we can find about Maupin and his relationship to slavery. If he says anything at all about slavery, about hiring, purchasing, discipline, that would be of some relevance in telling the story of Berkeley Bullock and his experience as an enslaved laborer at the university. Or, if not at the university, in the employ of 